Roy, I've been obsessed with free will and I've been talking to philosophers and philosophers have very complicated kinds of analysis of free will, it goes back centuries and I've been immersed in that. And a couple have said, maybe I should talk to a social psychologist. You think that's a good idea? <laughs> well, how can I say no? Uh, I think talking to psychologists could be, could be helpful. We have different approaches. I was actually briefly a philosophy major, uh, hmm. flirted with mathematics also. Uh, what attracted me to psychology is you could take some of these philosophical questions and collect data on them and use the scientific method, uh, which has been one theme of my career. Uh, in philosophy, uh, it's, it's hard to really prove somebody wrong in a definitive manner. Uh, it's a little bit easier with, with data. I know philosophers now themselves, some of them are starting to take up doing experiments. This is a development we didn't anticipate some time mm -hmm. ago, and, and that's, that's very, very nice. That's very exciting. Uh, but, of course, it's difficult uh, for them. Uh, you can't just start out of the blue doing experiments. It, uh, in psychology, we've worked for decades to improve our methods and do our experiments better and better. Uh, our learning curve will help philosophers, perhaps, uh, if they learn from us, but uh, still it's, it's not an easy thing uh, to do. So, you may be interested in the same questions, but do you approach them merely by thinking very carefully and looking for examples uh, in the world around you? Um, or do you do them by doing experiments that will collect data and uh, uh, test theories and prove some right and wrong? Uh, in, in big questions like free will. Uh, we need all the methods and approaches we can get, so I, I, I definitely think we have something to add, which is not to say the philosophers should uh, just listen to us or <laughs> give up or go home or anything like that. So, so what are some examples? Uh, how can you uh, dissect the various uh, sub-aspects uh, of the free will problem uh, so that you can subject it to the rigors of, the, of social psychology methodologies or even, indeed, experiments in the laboratory? Okay, we can look uh, a bit about how free will works, how people make decisions, how people exert self-control. I've noticed while reading the philosophy uh, books on, on free will, many of the examples they invoke are A, self-control, or B, making decisions and choices. And they just sort of toss those out separately. In psychology, we've been able to show that these two have a common root. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in studies in our lab, they show that when people make decisions, it uses up some of their willpower, and so afterwards uh, their self-control is worse. Uh, and conversely, after they exert self-control, then their decision-making is impaired. At least they have less energy to think things through or mm. choose carefully or rationally. Mm. Um, so there is some underlying common trait uh, that's used for self-control, for making intelligent decisions. Uh, also for uh, initiative, probably for planning too. So we can say all these things are tied together and, and show that experimentally in a way that uh, you know, a philosopher is not really able to do with the tools at his or her disposal. And does that change our understanding of those different elements? You mentioned planning, uh, decision-making, uh, self-control or control, uh, all overlapping but different kinds of concepts that uh, have been subjected to philosophical analysis. But if you're saying that at least in part they have some sort of a common denominator that you've been able to show in the lab, does that affect uh, what they are in themselves, those concepts? Well, yes, uh, certainly they point to that there is some real, uh, real process, uh, some common theme physiologically, psychologically, uh, associated with uh, exertion of free will. Uh, so that opens up uh, new ways of thinking about it and looking about it. Change is the problem some too. Philosophers have debated this for a long time, yes or no. Mm -hmm. Do people have free will or don't they? Uh, in psychology, almost everything's on a continuum. Mm -hmm. uh, everything's gradual. And I think particularly for free will, uh, we're not going to give an answer to saying yes or no, people do or don't have mm -hmm. free will. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, we're going to say a person's capacity to act in a, a free will type manner with good self-control, with rational decision making, stuff like that. A person's capacity to do that goes up and down. It depends on something like an energy supply that gets kind of used up and so uh, later in the day your decisions are perhaps worse than earlier in the day. Uh, the, you know, after a strenuous uh, uh, time of uh, exerting self-control you might uh, uh, skimp on the decisions or vice versa. So we can show how these things uh, uh, are, are interlinked. But again, it's, it's going to be more a matter of degree uh, of free will rather than 
yes or no, people have it or don't. Philosophers have very particular kinds of concerns, such as uh, this concept of determinism, that everything has been set in the universe before and that we think we have uh, free will when we, when we can't do otherwise, but some people think that, that you can still have free will, and it's called compatibilism or incompatibilism, you have to be able to do other things. Are these philosophical, uh, very abstract kinds of notions, uh, are, how, how do they affect the, uh, the practicality of, of uh, free will in, in, in real life? Well, my sense and my views may be a little bit unusual on this, but I've, I've been thinking about it and studying it for a long time. Uh, is that at least for us in social science, the free will against determinism argument is not the argument that we should be having. That's not not helpful for us. And so even the, the nature of the problem might need to be uh, reconsidered. Uh, instead of saying, uh, you know, does some abstract understanding of causality make it impossible that people can really make choices because the future is just as sad as the past and you're just going through the motions. Um, Instead of that, or arguing about whether causality is involved or not, you know, how would we ever prove in, in a series of experiments, you know, experiments are based on the assumption of causality, so how could you prove or disprove that causality is involved? Uh, what we can do very well is look at how these processes come together and operate inside the individual. Uh, so the question for us, instead of should it be determinism, I think we should, we should forget about this, we should operate, we should understand how do people confront a situation where there are multiple possibilities, uh, where something might happen and might not happen, uh, a threat, an opportunity, a, a decision, uh, who should I marry, what should I have for dinner, what should I, uh, what line of work, what should I write my doctoral dissertation on. Mm. Um, these, you know, lumping causality into one category, this is, this is not very productive and not very useful for us, and especially we in social science haven't thought as carefully and in a sophisticated a manner about causality perhaps as, as philosophers have, and we tend to think in very simple models of the billiard ball hitting the other. But the causality by which a billiard ball hits the other and moves it, or by which water flows downhill instead of uphill, or a magnet picks up a, a nail, is completely different from someone deciding whether to marry this person or that person, sure. or deciding, as a, again, what to do your doctoral dissertation on there where you can, there's an agent and a living thing with contingencies it will have to live with, with mental representations of the future. Uh, so to me, we should just say free will is, is another kind of causality, a different kind. There are already many, many, many kinds. Chemical causes don't reduce to physical causes. Biological ones, not purely the chemical ones. Economic ones, not purely the psychological ones. Um, so it, there's no way to explain the, say, the worldwide uh, financial collapse of 2009 in terms of billiard ball causality or the movements of electrons or anything like that. So at each level, there are new kinds of, of causes that emerge. And free will is like that. It's a bit like going from chemistry to biology, from inanimate things to living things. There was a leap there. Uh, to non-conscious things, to conscious things. And in the same way, free will emerges at a higher level. I also think we're not born with free will, maybe with the capacity to acquire it, but uh, a newborn baby doesn't have free will, so we can study even in the course of the developing individual, of the growing child, how does it become able to think about choices, to understand options, to exert control, to exert self-control. It's again a big challenge for the kids, starting with mm -hmm very simple things like toilet training and not hitting other kids and all that, uh, to growing up to where you can be turned loose in the world and live in civilized society and pay your rent and vote and mow your lawn and do all the things that, uh, that you're supposed to. So uh, looking at the process by which free will is acquired and exercised, that's, I think, a, a more appropriate challenge for us uh, than trying to argue with uh, some bizarre uh, uh, argument of uh, you know, is there or is there not causality involved and uh, is there really the determinism another part determinism insists that there is only one possible future and that makes it impossible for us to do most of what we do in psychology which is how do people deal with situations where there are choices you can say oh you didn't really have a choice even something simple like going to a restaurant and uh, should I have the chicken or the fish? And so, uh, I guess I'll have the chicken. And then the determinist says, well, 
technically that was predetermined that ever since the Big Bang, it was inevitable that you had had the chicken, that there was really never any chance that you had the fish. How does that help? It doesn't help us understand or explain how the person came around to choose the chicken rather than the fish. The person had to operate as if the chicken and the fish were both on the menu and were both possible. Uh, and uh, I think the psychologist uh, trying to understand that has to understand that in the same way. In 1965, uh, Free Will of Philosophy. Roy, in understanding free will, I have focused on the philosophy of free will because free will is a philosophical topic. It's been that way for several centuries, I think, and I've also begun to talk to neuroscientists, um, physicists. Um, first time I'm talking to a social psychologist. Uh, is this a good use of my time to understand <laughs> free will? Well, you know, psychology split off from philosophy a century and a half ago uh, because uh, we we're interested in the same questions. We're just going to approach them differently using the experimental method. Uh, and that was one of the things that attracted me to it. I'm interested in a lot of the philosophical questions, including free will. Uh, but we can work on them with a different uh, approach. We can do experiments. We can understand what uh, the processes are. As, as we tackle these problems, I think social psychology has a lot to say uh, about free will, about how people make choices, about how they exert self-control, about how they make moral judgments, and, and, and so forth. Uh, it's, uh, it's a different sort of approach. We can do things the philosophers can't. They can do things, perhaps, that we can't. Uh, but with a topic like that, I think you want uh, multiple perspectives and multiple pathways to approach it. That's very good. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a very good.